Welcome to this week's Bible study portion, and we're going to look at the Torah portion called Vaera. Uh, we find this in Exodus 6, verse 2 to 9, and um, no, Exodus 6, verse 2 to um, Exodus 9, verse 35. And I don't know if you've had time to look at the um, other part of the study in Ezekiel, but if you look at the passage in Ezekiel, you'll see that there's a lot of similar words and phrases being used in Ezekiel that corresponds to the passage in Exodus. Um, so that's just something interesting to look at. Um, but what I want us to note uh, this week in this specific part where we start looking at the judgments that come on Egypt in the form of this, uh, the 10 plagues is that there is a direct link between the account of the Exodus and Revelation. So we know that Revelation is the end time prophecy. It's a time when we will see the greater Exodus where God will take his children out of all four corners of the earth. And it will happen in, in pretty much the same way that we see it happening in Exodus, where there will be judgment inflicted on Egypt. But in Exodus, uh, Egypt is called Babylon. And uh, those same judgments uh, are a big blessing and a time of redemption for God's children. So while we look at this study uh, today, I want you to keep this in mind that we are looking at the Exodus story as a picture of times to come, of the end times to come. It's also a picture of prophecy of the end times, but it's also on a smaller, more individual scale, each one of us our own story of redemption from sin. So I want you to keep this smaller, more intimate picture of your own life in, in the back of your mind as we study this, but also the bigger picture of the end times and what is still to come. And we find this uh, prophecy of the end times of the greater exodus in, in quite a few passages in the Bible. And the one that I chose specifically for us to look at was Isaiah 11, verse 11 to 12. It says, on that day, Adonai will raise his hand again a second time to reclaim the remnant of his people who remain from Asher, Egypt, Patros, Ethiopia, Elam, Shinar, Hamat, and the islands in the sea. He will hoist a banner for the Goyim, assemble the dispersed of Israel, and gather the scattered of Judah from the four corners of the earth. So I want you to look specifically at the part where it says he will raise his hand, because we'll see that in Exodus 6 that we're going to look at now. Um, a second time he's speaking about a remnant, and we'll discuss right at the end of the study the remnant and Goshen and the significance of that. But we see in the story of Egypt, we often think it's the Jews that were uh, redeemed from Egypt, that were set free. But at that time, there was nothing like a Jew. It was Israel. It was the full 12 tribes. Jews only came later on where, from the tribe of Judah and a small portion of the tribe of Benjamin. So I want you to get rid of this idea that it's the Jews that were set free from Egypt. It was all 12 tribes of Israel. And it was also a mixed multitude. It also speaks of a mixed multitude that left Egypt with Israel. And where does this mixed multitude of people come from? So there were some of the Egyptians that through the works of judgment that God brought on Egypt, realized that he is the one true living God. And so they gave up their pagan practices and they adopted this God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and they lived with the Israelites. But in the time that the Israelites were oppressed in Egypt, they were really a, a big um, player on the global arena. And Egypt had a lot of slaves from different countries. So we find that the mixed multitude is also made up of other nations. So in truth, the Exodus story is a story of all of us. It's the story of the Goyim, which is the nations. It's the story of the dispersed of Israel. And it's the story of the Jews. All together, God says, I'm going to redeem all of you that have been scattered to the four corners of the earth. And again, with his raised hand. And we're going to look at this in more detail now. 
So we see that there are four redemptions that's spoken of in this passage of Exodus 6 verse 67, and I highlighted them for you in this passage. It says, therefore say to the sons of Israel, I am Hashem and I shall take you out from under the burdens of Egypt or Mitraim, and I shall rescue you from their service and I shall redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great judgments. And I shall take you to me as a people and I shall be for you a God. And you shall know that I am Hashem your God who takes you out from under the burdens of Mitraim or Egypt. So there we find the full redemptions. And when you look at this quickly, it kind of seems like the Lord is saying the same thing in four different ways. You know, but in reality, each one of these statements um, points us towards four different kinds of redemption that the Lord brought to Israel, but that he also brings to each one of us in our individual journey of um, being saved, of redemption, and that he will bring again in the end times. These two verses that God spoke to Moses at the beginning of this week's passage of study contain the four expressions of redemption. Now, Rabbi Hirsch stated that this is a systematic reversal of the Egyptian exile. So where do we find the prophecy that there will be a, an oppression of the Israelites in Egypt? And we find that in Genesis 15 verse 13, where the Lord foretold to Abraham that his descendants will go into Egypt and be oppressed. So these four redemptions that God gives to Israel is really a reversal of this oppression that was foretold in Genesis 15 verse 13. In Genesis 15 verse 13, Hashem said to Abraham, you shall surely know that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs, and they will serve them and they will oppress them for 400 years. Now, what's interesting is two things. In the Hebrew, there's two ways to read this passage. They will serve them. Um, can either be read as Abraham's descendants will serve the Egyptians, which was what happened. But there's a spiritual meaning to this as well. And if you turn it around, it actually means that the Egyptians will serve the descendants of Israel. And what, what does that mean? Well, if we think of Joseph's life that we looked at a few weeks ago, we know that God uses the trials and tribulations in our life to serve his purpose and it's a time when he builds character and when we go closer to him and where he takes all the impurities out of us and that's really what the sages say is this double meaning to they will serve them yes physically the israelites serve the egyptians but spiritually god used the egypt the egyptians they actually served his purpose and they were used as a way of cleansing uh, um, Abraham's descendants. So that's really something beautiful if you look at it in that double meaning. Another thing that's interesting is that it wasn't 400 years that the Israelites were in oppression and in captivity in Egypt. If you do a study on the genealogies and how old each person got, you will note that this 400 years started at the beginning of Jacob's birth. And we can see this oppression in Jacob's life because Jacob didn't live in the land that Abraham lived in. He went to Lot. He worked there for uh, oh, Laban. Sorry, he went to Laban. He worked there for many years for his two wives. Even when Jacob meets um, Pharaoh many years later, he says to Pharaoh, I had a really tough life. I've had a hard life. So the oppression already starts with the birth of Jacob. And from there, um, the Bible counts 400 years until we find ourselves in Exodus 6, where we are looking at this week um, of God's redemption of the Israelites. So let's quickly look at the four redemptions of the Exodus. 
From this verse in Genesis, we see that the exile is described as comprising of three increasing levels. So first it begins as they are strangers in a foreign land. It escalates to them serving the Egyptians and then to being oppressed by the Egyptians. And so the redemption from this exile will take the form of undoing of these levels, beginning with the most difficult one, which is I will take you out from under the oppression or the burdens of Egypt. So you're being released from the burden of oppression. And if you think of your own life, what is the burden of oppression that each one of us were redeemed from and um, that we got released from and that is the burden of sin and death so the moment we accepted yeshua and he came into our lives he sets us free from the burden of being oppressed by our sins and the burden of oppression of death that comes with sin the second redemption is I will save you from their service. And that is freeing them from having to serve the Egyptians. And what do we read all through the word of God is that our soul should submit under our spirit. Our spirit should be ruling and we should be in service of God and his spirit, not in service of our evil desires and inclinations and our sins. So we no longer serve the God of this world but we serve the God of heaven. The third redemption is I will redeem you. And that is being made free of the indignity of being aliens in a foreign land with no status, standing and recognition. So that is I'm adopting you, you my child, I've got a, a future for you, um, I will bless you, uh, you are valuable to me, I paid the ultimate price for your life, I'm restoring your self worth and your value that got lost in this process of being oppressed by the burdens of sin and of death. And then we'll look at the fourth redemption in a few slides now. First, I want us to look at what does it mean when God says with an outstretched arm and by a mighty hand. So what's interesting to note is the contrast with the first two expressions, if we look at Exodus 6, which specifies what the people are redeemed from. So they redeemed from their burdens and they redeemed from service. That's what the first part of the passage tells us. But the third expression instead focuses on how will this happen? How will this redemption come to, to fruition. And this is through the outstretched arm and a mighty hand. And this is with great judgment. So what I want to stop here and just say to you is, um, firstly, when I think of the outstretched arm and the mighty hand, um, I immediately see Yeshua on the cross. I see the Messiah because his arms were stretched out and his hands were nailed to the cross. So there's that messianic prophecy in it. The sages of Israel say the outstretched arm is Elijah and the mighty hand is Moses. God used Moses to bring them out of uh, captivity. And um, Moses is symbolic of the Torah. Moses is symbolic of the commandments of God. So if we look at it in that way, that Elijah symbolizes prophecy. And Moses symbolizes the Torah and the word of God. What is it that God used to bring those captive slaves out of Egypt and to redeem them? He used prophecy and he used the commandments, the Torah, the word of God. And what do we find all through the word of God in the form of prophecy and the word, the commandments, the Torah that came to life and lived among us? is Yeshua. So we can see this beautiful picture of the outstretched arm and the mighty hand that is prophecy, Torah, and it all equals Yeshua. He's the one that releases us from the burdens of captivity. And now the question is why? Why did God not just strike Pharaoh and kill him once? 
Why didn't God just cause some terrible disease to come over the Egyptians and over Pharaoh? Um, why all of these judgments? Why take about a whole year to bring these humiliating and devastating judgments on Egypt? and um, to redeem the Israelites. You know, I could have done it much faster and easier. And the question is quite simple. The answer to this question is quite simple. It's through this that the Lord restored the prestige of the Israelites. So what does this mean? We know that even when Israel, when the 12 tribes came to Joseph in the time of famine, we see that the word says that the Egyptians looked down on them. They said that they were abomination because they were herdsmen. They, they kept um, sheep and they were shepherds and the Egyptians despised them. So even from the beginning, when they came into Egypt, um, they, they didn't have a high status. Uh, they were looked down on. And after all of these years of um, oppression and slavery, the Lord used these amazing signs and judgments to show the Israelites that to him, they are not of no value. In fact, that there is immense value in them and that they are deserving of these great miracles that he worked to redeem them and to set them free and that their oppressors would be punished. <laughs> Sorry, I'm laughing at my cat <laughs> that's making her debut <laughs> behind me. Okay. So this is the final point of their redemption. And this is the fourth stage of redemption. And that is that I will take you to me as a people. You are precious to me. So the Lord expresses the purpose of this entire Egyptian experience to enable the people to receive the Torah. And what is the Torah? So it all culminates in them getting out of Egypt and being at the, uh, the foot of Mount Sinai and the Lord giving his commandments. That is where he wanted to take them. And he used this whole process in Egypt to get them to Mount Sinai. And we so uh, wrongly believe that the Torah is the law. And I want you to think of uh, what we discussed a few weeks ago, where we said that when there is a translation from the Hebrew into another language of the word of God, there's always things that get lost in translation. There's meaning and substance and context that gets lost in translation. So I want you to think of that game that we used to play as children where you all stand in a row and then one will whisper a sentence and the next one will whisper to the next one. And by the end of the uh, line, the last one that will then say the sentence, we all laugh at how uh, skewed the message got every time that someone else translated the message. And sadly, that's exactly what happened with God's word. Um, it was translated law, and that sounds very strict, but in Hebrew, Torah means instruction. It actually means the loving instruction of the father. So if you're a mommy or a daddy, just think of yourself and your children in your own home. There's certain instructions you give your children of what to do and what not to do because you love them. You want them to be safe. You want them to be blessed. And that's the same for our heavenly father. It's his loving instructions. What I want you to note also in this passage of Exodus 6 verse 6 to 7 is that there's the word burdens that, that we see twice in the English and also in the Hebrew, the word burdens uh, reflect twice. It says, therefore say to the sons of Israel, I am Hashem and I shall take you out from under the burdens of Egypt and I shall rescue you from this service and I shall redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great judgments. And I shall take you to me as a people and I shall be a God to you. And you shall know that I am Hashem, your God, who takes you out from under the burdens of Egypt. So another handy Bible study tool is that when there are words or phrases that repeat, God is trying to emphasize something. He's trying to draw our attention to something. 
And this is especially um, significant in the Hebrew if we look at these two words of burdens, because in the Hebrew there is a difference in the spelling um, between these two words burdens. The first time it's written, it's missing the letter Vav at the end. So I want you to remember that Hebrew is written from the right to the left. So there's the first time we see the word um, burden in Hebrew, but you can see it's missing the Vav there. While the second time it is written in full with the Vav. So there you can see there's a Vav added. So in English, we miss this because we just see burden and burden. But in Hebrew, there's something missing. There's a Vav missing in the first word burden and it's present in the second one. And so we should ask ourselves, what is the explanation for this? So first, I just quickly want to explain to you the letter Vav, if you look at it there, it looks like a little hook. It's a hook that connects. And so we can see that it's trying to tell us in the text that there's a connection. There's something that connects these two burdens. Um, there's a connection there that we need to notice. And the sages offer the following explanation for these two burdens that are spelled differently. It's believed that the Israelites did not just suffer under the physical and material oppression, but that there was a significant spiritual decline. So it's important to notice that the redemption from Egypt included a spiritual redemption and rehabilitation as well. And that's where I want you to think of that little hook of the Vav. It's oftentimes when we go through a physical or material oppression or struggle, there's a spiritual connection to it as well. It's very seldom that you can separate the two from each other. Um, the problem is that when we suffer from a physical trial, we're very aware of it. But when we suffer from a spiritual problem, we tend to be oblivious to it. And I want you to think of an example, let's say um, medically, so physically in your body, you are um, struggling with something, with a disease or an illness or an ailment or uh, some kind of problem in, uh, medically in your body. You are aware of it. You know it's there, right? Or if you think of material oppression, you're struggling financially, economically, you lost your job. Um, you know, you're very aware of that because we are in a physical body, in a physical world. We know exactly when we are experiencing trials, tribulations, suffering, oppression physically. But we don't always realize that this physical thing that I am suffering from, there is a spiritual connection linked to it. And that the spiritual connection might actually be that there's something spiritually that's not sound in our lives or that's lacking in our lives that we need to deal with. And if we deal with that spiritual issue, often the physical thing that we're struggling with, we experience healing in. And like I said, you know, we, we desensitized to the spiritual because we live in a physical world with a physical body. So I want you to, even if you have to pause the video here for a moment and just ask the Holy Spirit to show you what in your own life are you struggling with physically in a relationship, um, in your finances, in your health, in some part of your physical life, what are you experiencing oppression with that could be linked to something spiritually that's not right in your life? Because you see, the Israelites are just like us. They were so focused on their physical struggles that they never even realized that through all of these struggles, they would really strayed quite far from God and from his ways. They were only aware of their physical oppression, but after being redeemed out of Egypt and receiving God's instructions, only then could they look back and recognize their spiritual decline. And that's so true of our own lives often as well. If you think of when you were unsaved, before you gave your heart to Yeshua and you repented and you started this journey of redemption, 
a lot of things that you were doing that was wicked and evil and sinful seem okay. But now if you look back, you can see and recognize how spiritually depraved you were in that time. So what is redemption for one is judgment for another. The same outstretched arm and mighty hand that inflicted judgment on the Egyptians brought blessing and redemption to the Israelites. And this is so important for us to keep in mind in our own lives and also in the end times to come. Because we see in Revelation, and a lot of people get very scared of Revelation because all they see is these judgments. But you don't have to be scared if you are on the right side of the judgments. Because what is described as judgment in Revelation against Babylon, against Egypt, against the sins of this world is really blessing and redemption to us. And how you experience your circumstances may actually reveal which side of this two-edged sword you're on. So if you read in Revelation and it scares you, you have to ask the Lord, Father, what is there in my life that looks like Babylon or that looks like Egypt? What is there in my life that will get judged in the end times? Because I need to deal with that now. Um, if And all of us, like I've, I've said it before, no one sorted out. We all have work to be done and we should be so humble in front of God and ask him daily to show us what in us is aligning with the image of the beast, aligning with, the, with Babylon and with Egypt, because that part of us will also experience the judgment that's to come. But the part of us that is aligned with the kingdom of God and with his commandments those of us that are aligned with it, we will experience it as blessing and redemption. So I want to uh, speak quickly about Goshen, because we see that when Israel came to Egypt in the famine, and when Joseph was reigning, when he was second in charge, he placed his father and his black brothers in a land called Goshen. Now, the word Goshen and Messiah in Hebrew have the same numerical value. So Hebrew is such an amazing language. Every alphabetical letter in Hebrew corresponds to a numerical value. And if you take the word Goshen in Hebrew, all of the letters that make up the word Goshen in Hebrew and you add the numerical values and you do the same with the word for Messiah, you get the numerical value of 358. And that's why the sages say Goshen is a picture of Messiah because it's got the same numerical value. So Goshen is really a symbol of messianic redemption. And Goshen means cultivated and fruitful land. It's so interesting that the place where the Israelites were safe from the judgment while Egypt was being destroyed was a place that was called fruitful land. And God's protection was there. Um, we also know that uh, Goshen, the first three plagues that hit Egypt was over the entire land of Egypt. But um, the last seven was only over Egypt. Goshen was safe. They did not experience that judgment of the last seven plagues. And um, this is so beautiful if you think of it, because Goshen is in Egypt, but it's not of Egypt. And isn't that what the word says about believers as well? That we are in this world, but we are not of this world. What's also interesting is that the word Goshen is only found twice in the Torah and it hints at the two comings of Messiah and Messiah ben Joseph and Messiah ben David. So Goshen, just like Messiah, where it's got the same numerical value, we know that there's prophecy that Messiah will come twice. And we also see the word Goshen in God's word only mentioned twice. 
And this is a picture for us of the first coming of Messiah as the son of Joseph and the second coming that will be in the end times as Messiah, the son of David. So by Joseph reuniting with Judah to form Jacob, the spirit of Messiah is restored. What does this mean? When Joseph was in Egypt, do you remember when we looked at that uh, blessing of Jacob over the sons and where we adopted Joseph's two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, and he made them his own and he blessed them. And we said, that's a picture of us, of the Gentiles that are grafted into um, Israel. That's what we're talking about here is that Joseph, and his sons that represent the Gentiles and Judah that represents the Jews and Jacob that represents Israel. Once they all come together and unite, that is when the spirit of Messiah is restored. And remember right at the beginning when we spoke about the second Exodus, that's exactly what the scripture foretold, that out of the four corners of the earth will come the Goyim, will come the sons of Judah, and will come the scattered of Israel, and that the Lord will bring them together again. And we know that that is when Messiah ben David will return. Now the word Vayichash and the word Goshen are from the same root Hash. And Hash in Hebrew means relationship. So we know that Goshen is all about relationship. You cannot be in Goshen and not have a relationship with Messiah. And that's so important, guys. You know, we often make this mistake where we think that um, I just need to pray the prayer and become born again, and then I'm going to heaven and everything's fine. But what we don't realize is, and Paul often speaks of that, is there's a process of being saved. So yes, uh, accepting the Lord Yeshua as your Messiah is the first step. But then there is a, a walk of righteousness that we need to do that we only find when we are in relationship with Messiah. And what does Messiah say is relationship with him? He says, if you love me, keep my commandments. And where do we find the commandments? We find the commandments in the Torah. At Mount Sinai, God gave the commandments. When Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments, there was no New Testament. So we see that if we want to be safe in the land of Goshen, we need to have a relationship with the Messiah. And having a relationship with him also points us towards a separation from that which is ungodly, which is pagan, which is of this world, and a gathering of like kind to like mind. If you are in Goshen, if you are in Messiah, if you are sold out to him and you want to be protected by him, you will bear the fruit of someone that is holy and set apart. Does that mean that we should now sell our house and go live in some godforsaken place and not have any contact with people no it just means that don't become like the world don't spend time with people that defile your spirit and where conversations that are being had um, is not something that you would have in front of the messiah where uh, jokes are being made that's um, uncomely you know we should be setting ourselves apart and bearing the fruit of the spirit of the Lord and acting like we are holy because he is holy. Um, and we see this, God's word says, be holy or set apart for I am holy. So I wanna leave you with this last question. If you think of this whole uh, uh, thing that we looked at now, where do you think you are currently finding yourself? Are you in Goshen? Are you in Messiah? Are you in relationship with him? Or are you still in Egypt? I hope you have a blessed Shabbat. Shabbat Shalom.